start our midweek service. Amen. We do want to open up with prayer. Amen. And ask the Lord's blessings here uh, to be with us. We're not just that, but we also want, amen, uh, to pray for the many people that are still sick with this uh, coronavirus. And not only the coronavirus, but also just many infirmities. A uh, little update on my dad. My dad uh, is doing well. I'm going into the rehab with him on Friday to go over some uh, some things that need to be done with him uh, to help him on his way. And then he'll be coming home sometime next week. And so uh, grateful for that, that all is well and we're able to bring him home. And uh, I know he's been uh, wanting to come home really, really bad. And uh, he sounded uh, like he wanted to come home two weeks ago, but he just couldn't. And so I'm uh, grateful here today uh, for all of this. Amen. So uh, we do want to uh, pray for those that are sick, continue praying for those that are in, also in rehab, Sister Nancy's uh, uh, grandmother. We want to pray for her and we want to pray for all of those Amen, that are sick in body. Precious Jesus, we pray, Lord God, that you would move and minister, God, freely as you desire, according to your word, O Lord. You promised that by your stripes we are healed. And I pray, Lord God, that you would move in a mighty way upon each and every one of those, Lord God, that are sick in body. We pray, Lord God, that you would touch, Lord God, those, Lord God, that have a need for you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bring a blessing upon those that feel distressed, those that feel troubled and pressed on all sides, oh God. I pray, Lord, those that are discouraged, those that are downtrodden, those that feel uh, low and heavy in their hearts, oh God. I pray, Lord, that you would minister and lift them up today, God. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen, everybody. Amen. Without further ado, <clears throat> we do want to go ahead and uh, get into our uh, Facebook Live uh, Bible study here tonight. I've got uh, quite a bit of pages uh, to go through. I may not uh, go through all of them, um, but I surely want to try to get through most of them. Uh, and the and I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8, and then I'm turning to the book of Mark chapter 1, verse number 17. And Isaiah 6 and 8 from the New King James Version, and it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And then in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse number 17, and it reads as such, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you uh, to become fishers of men. Amen. The topic here that I want to talk to you all tonight about uh, in this Bible study lesson is availability and not ability. Availability and not ability. You see, the Lord is looking for those that uh, do have talents, do have uh, uh, are a blessing to other people. God wants to touch those and use them. But more than those things, he wants us to be available to him and for him. And it's because of him and it's by him. That are uh, by his stripes we are healed. It's because of his blood that he shed on the cross at Calvary. It's because he gave his life for us that we ought to give our lives for him. Amen, somebody. And God is moving in across this world and upon this earth, oh, searching to and fro. And he's looking for somebody that's making themselves available to him. And so uh, when Jesus, uh, the Lord, uh, began to move on the prophet Isaiah, and he said, who shall I send and who is going to go for us? The prophet Isaiah felt an unction. He felt a pulling on his heart. He felt a desire that he said, here am I or here I am. 
for I am here. It really doesn't matter how you say it. What matters is that you apply it and you say, yes, here I am. Yes, I'm available. Yes, I'm answering the call that you're calling me to, Lord. And so with all of this, Jesus also said in the book of Mark, as we read, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, it was the great story, amen, the great teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and the stories that he began to tell, these parables and, and all of this that uh, God began to do for uh, the people that were hungry for God. They were hungry for the things of God. They were hungry to hear the word, things uh, that they had never heard before. Uh, they heard the word uh, being taught like they've never heard it before. They heard principles and concepts uh, of the word of God that they had never heard before. They they felt passion from the word. They, they felt uh, uh, a sincerity from the word. And so uh, as Jesus began to go through the Sermon on the Mount, and in chapter Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 1, and it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and he, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. I want to say that doesn't mean that they're flat broke. And uh, they pull, they put their hands in their pockets and pull out lint and dust and dirt. That's not what he's talking about. But he said, when, you know, when people are poor, we don't have enough. When we're poor, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough clothes. We don't have enough gas in our in, in our cars or vehicles. Sometimes we don't even have a vehicle. Sometimes we just have a bicycle. Sometimes we just barely have enough in our cupboards to eat for that week or even for that day. Been there, done that. And I know what it feels like not to know where your next meal is going to come from because it's happened to me. And I know it's probably happened to some of you because I am not the only one in the world that has ever been through some struggles, that ever been through some heartache, that ever been through some pain. I know some of you have been through that through that problem too, through that situation, through that circumstance. You've been uh, torn uh, from the inside out. Your heart's been ripped out, stepped on, smashed into a thousand million little pieces, uh, amen, and then swept up and thrown into the trash can for no one to ever love ever again. Everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. I think I'm going to go eat worms. I think that's the way we feel sometimes. You know, let's just, let's just, uh, a little dirt don't hurt, so might as well add some more. You know what? Uh, Jesus was saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why would he talk about the poor right here? Blessed are the poor. That means you don't have enough of God. You don't have enough from God. And you want more of God. You want God. You want the Lord to move in your life. You want the blessings of God. And Jesus was saying, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to know here tonight that there's a spiritual reciprocation that is happening. It's a give and a take. It's a reap what you sow. Amen. It's, it's a process. It's like the waves of the ocean. There's a coming and then there's a go. And so we've got to understand the principles in the word of the Lord here tonight is that Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor spirit. You don't have enough of Jesus in your life and you need more and you desire more. And you can never, 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 ever get enough of the Lord. Amen. If that's you, the Bible says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want the kingdom of heaven. You want the kingdom of God. You want the power of God. You want the anointing of God. You want the touch of God. You want the blessings of God. You want the healing of God. You've got to give something to get something from God. And he's asking you, amen, to have a desire in you that will never be filled, that will never satisfy you, amen, that you'll never want anything more from God, but that you'll always want more from God. The Lord. Is there an amen out there tonight? 
And so Jesus is given this concept, this precept, and the multitudes are gathered around and people are trying to hear every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And here he opened his mouth and gave these words. And I can imagine how quiet everybody was trying to listen to the word of God. And in Matthew 5 and verse number 4, he said, blessed are those who mourn. Why would he talk about blessings with those that mourn? Mourning is because there's a devastation. It's because somebody's hurting. It's because somebody lost somebody in their family. They lost their mama, their daddy, their grandma, their grandpa. They lost their cousin, their best friend, their spouse, whoever it was, they lost something. They lost something that had a whole lot of meaning. And he said, those that mourn, Blessed are those that mourn because they're going to be comforted. You see, what Jesus was teaching was more than just what they needed right then and there. It was more than just a little bit of, I bless you, or smile, and it makes you feel better. It was a little more than you use more muscles uh, uh, frowning than you do smiling. It's more than just little cute little cliches and concepts. Jesus was saying, he said, blessed are those that mourn because they're going to be comforted. Because Jesus said, I will pray the Father and the Father will send a comforter and I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Jesus is telling the people without them realizing that he was their comforter. The comfort was from him and his words brought life. Amen. And so Jesus was continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount in verse number five of Matthew chapter five. Blessed are the meek. He didn't say the weak, but he said the meek. You know, we people try to take advantage of the meek. People try to take advantage of, of the niceness of people. They try to take advantage until we have to put our foot down sometimes. But just because we have to put our foot down doesn't mean we have to get nasty and ugly. Because Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You want a greatest inheritance that mankind has ever known? Uh, we think of great inheritance as property, as money, as, as vehicles, as things, as items. Uh, we have no idea. The Bible tells us uh, that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for you and I. Amen. Right now. God has a great blessing for somebody in this world to come. It's more than just trying to build up for ourselves now. The Bible talks about building up for ourselves in our most holy faith. Amen. That doesn't mean people, places, and things. That means a spiritual condition that we are to live in. And God will bless you. And in due season, he will lift you up. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. So if you're uh, meek, if we humble ourselves, that has to do with humility. Amen. If we're meek in our heart and our spirit, we will inherit the blessings of God. It says we will inherit the earth. And in Matthew 5 and 6, and it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means I want more of God. Have you ever had a good steak or a good piece of chicken or some ice cream or some chips and dip or whatever it is that your favorite food is? And you couldn't just have one bite and you couldn't just have one plate and you had to go get up and help yourself some more. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be hungry. He wants us to be thirsty. I don't know about you, but working in the sun or after a long hot day and working out and sweating and it works up an appetite, but more than an appetite, I want something cool to quench my thirst. And sometimes one cup of, of cool water doesn't work. And sometimes we need two or three or a nice big 32 ounce Gatorade or whatever it is. Amen. So that we will be quenched. And Jesus wants to quench that thirst because he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. After righteousness, for they shall be filled because God wants to fill you through and through. But you know what? When we get filled, just like any other meal, just like any other drink, it comes and it goes. And we've got to get filled again. Later on tonight, I'm going to snack on something. Tomorrow, I'm going to be hungry again. 
And then for breakfast, after I eat breakfast, I'm going to want something for lunch. And after lunch, I'm going to want something for dinner. I'm telling you, the cycle is monotonous and it doesn't stop. Amen. But I like it and I like to eat food. And I'm hungry and thirsty for the things of God in the in the same manner or even greater. Amen. I want to have a, a be poor in spirit. I don't ever want to have too much of God. Amen. I, I want to I want I want to be comforted. I want to be meek and I want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen. So that I can be filled. And verse number seven. Amen. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Amen. For they shall obtain mercy. Amen. We want mercy. We've got to give mercy. We want expect mercy. We've got to show mercy. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. And then verse number eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You know what? I don't know about you, but I want to see God face to face. Amen. Maybe not right now at this moment. Some of you, if, I, if we were to be able to ask you face to face, if I was to ask you face to face, do you want to see God right now? Some of you would say no. Some of you would say yes. I guarantee there would be a lot more that said no. I'm not ready. Jesus wants us to be ready. He wants us to have the right attitude. You see, he wants availability. It's not your talents. It's not what you can do. It's not what you learned in school. Amen. It's availability saying, Jesus, here I am. He's looking for somebody to call upon today. He's looking for somebody to talk to today. He's looking for somebody to trust in today. Amen. There's too many examples of the scriptures where he tested the faith of Abraham and he wanted to see if Abraham can be trusted. Amen. He talked to Moses and he convinced Moses that he can do it with the help of his brother. And eventually Moses uh, let go of all the help of his brother and just started speaking up for himself. God wants to build confidence in you and I. God wants to build trust in you and I. God wants to build faith in you and I. Amen. And how more appropriate for us to do it, to want to see him, is to go through the pains of this world, to go through the situations and lift our head high. Amen. Even though struggles may come and pressure may go. All we need to know is that we've got to be faithful to him and make ourselves available for the Lord. And it says, blessed in verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Amen. We want to be the children of God, the daughters of God, the sons of God. We've got to make peace. Amen. With not just God, but those around us. Verse number 10 Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you're crossing the line, Jesus. Now you're carrying it a little too far. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. What are you talking about, Jesus? He said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. That means that we are going to go through some stuff. That means we're going to struggle. People are going to persecute us. People are going to make fun of us. They're going to mock us. They're going to they're going to tell us all, oh, all of a sudden you're going to be Christian. All of a sudden you're going to go to that church. All of a sudden all the prophets are going to come out of the woodwork and all the parking lot prophets are going to want to stand up and tell you what God's word says and it doesn't says. They say, why are you going to that church? Why are you going here? The Bible doesn't say this. God doesn't care about this. It's all of a sudden it becomes their opinion and they know everything about all the Bible when they're not faithful to God themselves. Well, you know what? Judge for yourself tonight and mark it against the word of the Lord. Don't mark it against any one particular person. Go against the word of God and judge for yourself and see what kind of person and attitude that they have and that they carry. If it's these B attitudes, amen, that Jesus is portraying here, amen, to this on the Sermon on the Mount. He's not just on the on the mountain, amen, teaching these people in, in that day, amen, but he's talking to you and I, he's talking to our hearts, he's talking to our minds and our spirits, uh, amen. He's reaching down into the middle of our life and he said, blessed are those uh, that are persecuted for righteousness sake because theirs is the kingdom of God. Then he continued on, blessed are you when they revive and persecute you. He continued, he said it again. He said, when they make fun of you, when they mock you, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. I'm telling you, I've been through that. I'm sure some of you have been through that. Amen. But because he said, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward, not here. 
It's not here. The reward is not coming by a, by a SUV. Amen. The Brinks truck is not going to drop off a load of cash and gold. I'm sorry. Amen. But it says your reward is going to be in heaven. So for the uh, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. So persevere. When you get persecution, you've got to persevere. That means you've got to push through. That means you've got to make it. You've got to take one foot forward just like you would any other time. Amen. You've got to make, uh, make every step count. You've got to live for God through the thick and the thin, through the good and the bad. This is what it's all about. I'm talking about availability and not ability. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus continued on the Sermon on the Mount. I love these verses right here. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. But, here's the caveat. But if the salt loses its flavor, how can it be seasoned? And it is good then for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a pretty quick flip, if you ask me. Jesus is saying, you're the salt of the earth. Now, if you've ever studied it, I've told our folks at uh, Christ Alive um, early last year or a or be little before that, but I've talked about the salt of the earth and see in the salt mines. They would go carving those out, out of the mountainside or underground, and they would use oxen and donkeys and bulls and they would take these animals down there and there was no union and there was no union break and there were no porta potties and there was none of that sanitary condition stuff there wasn't even hand sanitizer they didn't even care about coronavirus all they did was the animals just did their business right where they were at and they would try to clean it up but they would go deep into the mines and cart it out well, everywhere they were stepping, there was dirt, but there was also sand and there was also salt. And the only time that salt, salt is a mineral. Salt doesn't just go bad unless the conditions around it are bad. Salt gets contaminated. That's what happens to salt. It gets contaminated. It gets watered down. It gets broken down by other contaminants. And that's why it becomes no good when we become contaminated by the things of the world, the rudiments of the world, amen, the, the judgments of men, amen, and, and, the, and the unrighteousness of the wicked, amen, begins to contaminate our lives, amen. That's why we need God more and more and more. And we've got, even though we rub shoulders with people every day, we can't stop them from cussing. We can't stop everybody from saying what they're going to say or do what they're going to do. But we can protect ourselves. Ourselves, and we don't have to let ourselves get contaminated by the things of the world. Somebody I know has an amen out there. And so we are the salt of the earth. We cannot afford to lose our flavor. Amen. We cannot be useless to be thrown out. You know what else salt is good for? Killing weeds. <laughs> salt is also good for uh, uh, helping pack the ground. That's what the Roman soldiers used to use, amen, to build the roads. They would throw salt to kill the weeds around it. The Roman soldiers were also paid their weight in gold was worth the salt. That's where the phrase, are you worth your salt, came from. Because if they were paid five ounces of gold, they would also get paid five ounces of salt. It would hold its value, and it was just as valuable as gold, amen, because it was traded by the merchants that would go to, the, to Asia and to China, and they would trade it and it had a very high value. And so everybody value their worth, amen, in gold and in salt, amen, you are valuable, that's what Jesus said, he didn't just say, hey, you're just a good flavor for this world, no, he said, you're worth something more, you're worth as equally as precious as gold, you're worth a lot to me and to everybody else, that's what we need to focus on, you don't need self-worth. You need your worth in the Lord. You need to put your trust in the Lord. You need to put your confidence in the Lord. You need to put your desires in the Lord. You need to put your faith in the Lord. You need to put your hope in the Lord and let your value grow in God. Amen. So persevere. 
Amen. So salt enhances the flavor of foods. And on a final note about the salt, amen, we are the savor to bring people to the Savior. I'll say that again. We are the savor, the taste, the flavor to bring people to the Savior, the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. If we're excited, people get excited. If we're happy, people will see we're happy. If we're if we're uh, content, God God will bless us. But people will see we're content in the Lord. Even though we may not have much, we may not have a lot. We may not be walking in wealth and riches. Amen. But I'm here to tell somebody: when you're available and you make yourself available and you don't worry about your talents and you just use let God use you and you let uh, you just use what God has given you for his glory i'm telling you here today that you are worth your salt in verse number 14 in Matthew chapter 5 you are the light of the world amen what does a light do it shines that's all you need to do is shine with the glory of God in your life a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden what the light just shines amen from a far away in the dark that light so bright amen is that bright lamp amen that brings people to god and in verse 15 neither do they light a lamp and put it under a basket you don't hide it amen but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all the house to all the house that means everybody that's there everybody that's in the place everybody you come in contact with Everybody that's all around, everybody that you see, everybody that you talk to, amen, can see the light shining before them. So Jesus said, so let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Don't hide. You're not an ostrich. Somebody needs to shine shine and shine some more amen uh don't think jesus said don't think that i am trying uh don't think that i am come amen uh to destroy the law or the prophets i did not come to destroy the law or the prophets but to fulfill that means to make complete, to make whole, just like he healed people in, in, the, in the New Testament when Jesus went around healing the lepers or, or he healed those that were uh, sick in their bodies and he made them whole. Amen. He made them complete. Jesus said, I'm not coming to destroy the law, the word of God. I'm coming to make it complete and nothing. He said, for surely I say to you till heaven and earth pass away, not one little bit, not by no means. That means everything. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly is staying in place until the will of God is complete. The last days, yes, we're in the last days. The end of the world, no, we're not the end of the world yet. Because the Bible tells us, amen, that the word of God will be preached into all the world. Hallelujah. So Jesus said that assuredly nothing is going to fall away until all is fulfilled. Amen. If you feel like you're fulfilled by God in your life, uh, uh, so be it. But I guarantee you not everybody's fulfilled in their life with God. Amen. And we've got to help them get there. We've got to be the light of the world. We've got to help them. We've got to be that salt of the earth, that savor, that flavor to bring people to God. And Jesus said, rest assuredly that nothing is going to pass. Nothing, everything's going to stay in place just like it is until God's will is fulfilled. Amen. For I say unto you, verse number 20, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, what that all means is that we've got to be just, we just got to focus on God. We can't worry about those that are just high and holy and their heads are in the clouds. We can't worry about that. We can't worry about the people that snob us. We can't worry about the people that, that try to take advantage of us. We can't worry about that. We don't have time for that. We've just got to be humble and meek and pure before the Lord. Amen. And then we can be fulfilled in the word of God. Amen. And by no means 
Nobody will enter the kingdom of heaven if we're snobby, we're passing people up, we're not obeying the word and the will of God. Amen. I'm telling you, here is the word of the Lord. It's that give and take process, that process of reciprocation that is happening. Matthew 5 and 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, talking about yourself to the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you. Amen. I just lost my feed here. Amen. Amen. Let's get back online. Let's go live again. Amen. Starting live. Three, two, one. Hopefully we'll connect here shortly. Amen. And so for I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something odd against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go your way. And then first make it right with your brother, make it right with your sister, and then come and offer yourself to the Lord. And then in verse Matthew 5 and verse number 41, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two miles. I'm talking about availability. I'm not talking about ability. Yeah, I can go two miles. Yeah, I, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do that. I can take care of this. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about if somebody says, hey, can you help me just a little more? Go ahead and do it. I mean, if not, if, I'm, we're not talking about people taking advantage of us. But in this particular time and day, the Roman soldiers would always try to take advantage of the Jews. They would always try to take advantage of their of their captive. But Jesus was saying, yes, they were required by law to take uh, and carry stuff for them for one mile. But Jesus said, if they ask you to go one mile, you go the second mile for them. You take it a step further. You show your availability. You show them you're better than the attitude that you're feeling. You show them that regardless of your feelings, you're going to do what's right and then some. That's what stands out from the crowd. That's what blesses God. That's what blesses others. That's what, that's what I believe when, when uh, Cornelius, uh, amen, was a Roman soldier and he, he humbled himself and he saw the people of God. I believe it turned his heart and he began to give and pray to the Lord and he started to have faith and grow. Amen. And God blessed him and Peter came and preached to him and brought salvation to him in his home. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who they are or what they propose to be. God is able to touch somebody. God is able to minister to somebody through their position, through their loftiness. Uh, you never know. Amen. You may be ministering somebody that was a ghetto. Amen. Living the life of a ghetto person. Uh, amen. Living in the streets. They were a hood rat. They were in the concrete jungle or jungle bunny or whatever you please. Amen. But they might be able to run into some wealthy banker or something and God touches their heart and they want to give and give and give themselves and their money and finances to the things of God. I promise you, when you begin to exhibit your availability for God and the things of God, God will use you in a tremendous way than you've ever partaken of before. Praise God. Amen. And so it's that process of reciprocation that you give, that ebb and that flow. Amen. What you reap, what you sow. It's that availability and not ability. Amen. That God is looking for today. Amen. And so all scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. And then he goes on specifically talking to the man of God, that the man of God may be complete, whole, made complete through the word of God, through the spirit of God, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And if we read a little further, he said, and that the man of God would help people to become perfected in God. That's impossible for me to do, but that's not impossible for God to do because it's his word. It's his spirit. It's his will. We've just got to pass on the message. I'm handing it off to you tonight. I'm handing over the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you the word of the Lord. I'm giving you the prescription that God has given for us, all of mankind, for you to receive. Take the gift that God is giving. Take the gift that God is promising. Take the gift that God is giving here today. 
In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. You see, Jesus was ready to make his move. He'd already prepared himself. And in Matthew chapter 4, we're not going to read this in its entirety, but he fasted 40 days because he took action. 40 days and 40 nights. Do you think he was hungry? Oh, I don't know about you, but I start to talk about fasting and I'm already hungry. So I can only imagine how hungry Jesus got after a few days and after a couple of weeks and then 40 days later. But then the Bible says he was taken out to be tempted by the devil. He knew, he knew, he knew. I'll tell you, it's the moment that you start fasting that somebody offers you a burrito. That you're the hungriest ever. And it's the most wonderful thing that you desire. And you struggle with that sacrifice. We've got to get beyond that. We've got to get past that. We've got to persevere. We've got to push. If we're ever going to be where God wants us to be. It's a struggle, I know. But that's the carnal nature. We've got to get under control. Praise God. And then when the tempter came to Jesus and he said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to be kind of bread. Oh, if you believe God, why doesn't he heal your body? Why doesn't he take away your glasses? Why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't God heal your, your dad? Why doesn't God heal your grandma? Why doesn't God do all of these things? If you believe that God is so great and so powerful and so real. People try to twist you up on what you believe. Just consider it. It's persecution. It's temptation to get you to waver and falter. I'm telling you, God's just looking for availability. He doesn't expect you to know every scripture. He doesn't expect you to, to be standing ramrod straight on the word of God. He doesn't expect you not to fall. He knows you're going to fall. He knows you're going to struggle. But just get back up and keep on moving forward, living for God. Keep on moving and so Jesus took action. And you're going to notice through all these scriptures in Matthew chapter 4, throughout the temptation of Jesus from the devil, when you take action, action will come against you. Everybody needs to know that. I think there should be a new conference class that when somebody gets baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I should, I should, I should put that into action myself. But when somebody starts making that step to live for God, all of a sudden all hell will break loose on you. All fire from hell will come at you because the devil doesn't want to lose his territory or his property. He doesn't want to lose a hold of what God is doing for you because he had you so good and carefree and careless. He didn't need to bother with you. But all of a sudden now, when you're trying to live for God and everything is going wrong and every trouble is coming at you and the walls are caving in and the wall, the, the rug is getting pulled out from under you and everything's going bad. I'm here to tell somebody today, amen, that you're not the only one. Jesus went through the same struggle and temptation. And he did that to prove that we can make it. Praise the Lord, somebody. We can make it. Yes, we can make it. Amen. And so the devil took Jesus up to the holy city and he took him and said, throw yourself down because then he used scripture at him. I'm telling you what, people are going to throw scripture at us and the devil's going to throw scripture at us and say, well, the scripture says this, so you might as well just jump off and take that leap of faith because if you really believe God, you're going to do what I tell you. Well, the devil's so stupid. Okay, we have common sense. Some people take the bait. I'm here to tell somebody, don't take the bait. You don't want that kind of challenge. You don't need that kind of pressure. All you have to do is humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And guess what? God will lift you up. Praise God. He's going to lift you up. He'll move you out of that situation. Because you got to get a backbone when you persevere, when you're being persecuted. And Jesus said, all these things I'll give you. Or Satan said, I'll give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. And that's what the devil wants to make everybody believe. Well, I'll back off and I'll give you fame and fortune and money and bling and all that stuff. But you know what? Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And when you stand your ground, you may not know a lot of scriptures. You may not know a whole lot about the Bible. Or how to live for God. But when you stand your ground. And you do your very best. And you try to quote a scripture. Though you may misquote it or not. The intent of your heart. Amen. I'll say like Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you. 
And then you run and get counsel and you get direction on how to fight the battle. And God will reveal to you and he'll strengthen you and you'll get counsel and you'll get the strength. Amen. I was uh, talking to somebody, texting somebody, amen, the other night and he needed counsel. He needed strength and I didn't have the answer for him. I promise you I did not. Amen. And if he's watching tonight, amen, uh, we had a very good conversation. But I will say this, amen, that I did not have the answer. I didn't know what to say. I just thought, well... It is what it is. And all of a sudden, God moved on me and gave me the words and the situation turned around for the moment. And all of a sudden, you can see where his, his attitude turned around and he felt better. Amen. And God began to move because it wasn't me. Amen. It was late at night. Amen. I was tired. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to think. I, I, I didn't know how to, how to make the situation better, but I couldn't do it. But I was available and I was engaging and God spoke to me and gave me the word and everything flowed and it's because I became available that God did and that's what God wants to do for somebody here today and for the rest of their life make yourselves available to God and God will use you in a mighty way I'm getting ready to close Amen. I've got a lot more to say but I won't belabor you too long here tonight Amen Peter after the great things that Jesus did Peter fell, turned his back on the Lord, walked away from Jesus. The rooster crowed three times. He felt his shame. He hung his head. He felt embarrassed, defeated, useless, good for nothing. Salt that was trodden underfoot of men. It was all a waste. He gave it all away. What's the use? All hope is gone. I might as well just feel sorry for myself and just go back to the way I used to be. Because apparently it didn't work for me. That's the way Peter felt. That's the way I get it from the story. Because I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what failure is like. I know what failure is like before living for God. And I know what failure is like after living for God. It's not good. But we can make it. We can survive. We can get through it. We just got to get back up. One foot in front of the other. And keep marching living for God. And so Peter, after he was reconverted to the Lord, he stood up on the day of Pentecost and he said some very important words because he was available and he responded to the question that was given to him. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the washing away of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you and to your children and all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God's still calling today. Amen. God's still knocking on somebody's heart's door. He's still tugging on our hearts. He's still pulling on us. He's still dealing with our lives. We're not perfect by any means but doesn't mean we should stay where we're at spiritually. Doesn't mean we should always stay struggling. That doesn't mean we should always give in. That doesn't mean that temptations won't come, but that we learn how to overcome those temptations, not by our own strength, but by our availability to God. I believe that's why the apostle Paul cried out to the Lord, God, take these from me. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. It's good enough for you. You're just gonna have to push through, buddy. I'm gonna help you through it. But you've got to go through it. And so then I want to iterate James chapter 1 verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, without a shadow of a doubt, God's goodness comes upon us without a shadow of a doubt. There's a few more scriptures. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Jesus said, in the greatest plea for availability, I believe that Jesus ever preached, the greatest plea for our availability and not ability is when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to me, to the Father, except through me. I believe Jesus was given this example. Here's a, a, a quick story. 
for the next two minutes and I will close. There's a story of a left-handed pitcher, probably the most celebrated athlete with a major disability in his era. I'm not gonna say what his disability was quite yet, but he became a national hero. And uh, he played for the California Angels in 1988. He won and pitched his and beat the Cuban national team in Cuba in 20, and those the first became the first pitcher and the first team to beat Cuba in 25 years. As a junior, he garnered a gold medal and is a member of the 88 Olympic team baseball team. He was crowned the amateur career by beating Japan in the final game of Seoul, Korea. In his first season in professional baseball, he won a spot in the starting rotation of the pennant, contending the Angels without an inning of minor league seasoning and established himself as a top flight major league pitcher. Well, he was about six foot three, weighed about 200 pounds in his prime, and uh, he had a disability, but he was pitching baseball. Abbott's parents, Jim Abbott's parents, uh, were still teenagers when he was born in Flint, Michigan in 1967. They didn't have much to offer, but they decided to give their best anyway. Mike and Kathy Abbott resolved to make their son's life as normal as possible through his disability. He, they sold cars, worked as a meat packer. Uh, Kathy took courses at home while raising Jim, and eventually both parents finished college, went on to successful career. And Jim's parents always encouraged him to try things and help him acquire confidence. That's what a good parent should do. Jim Abbott began developing the remarkable hand-eye coordination that would allow him to do what he did. He spent hours throwing a rubber ball against the brick wall, catching it, catching on the rebound. His father helped him develop the technique for handing um, for his uh, glove hand switch that allowed Jim to throw and catch the ball with the same hand. At the age of 11, Jim joined the Little League team, threw a no-hitter in the first game he pitched. There's lots of stories of how Jim failed as well, and, and even his hitting was very good, and, and uh, Jim batted from the left side, and uh, he had a very good record, and I, I promised it not to go too long. He became uh, a national exposure uh, in his high school football accomplishments, uh, was featured on NBC's NFL Today pregame show, and he was drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays out of high school in the 36th and last round of the draft, but he turned down the $50,000 bonus offer uh, to attend the nearby University of Michigan. Amen. Through all his resolve and everything he did, amen, he continued on. He continued on as being a baseball player, and, and even though he had some losses, uh, he was a winning contender. Jim continued to develop as a pitcher and began to seriously think about professional baseball. He won his first division with the Wolverines in the Big Ten East Division. He went to the conference championship through a shutout game in the NCAA tournament. Amen. He won 11 games against three losses. Uh, he earned a top spot in the U.S. National Amateur Baseball Team, uh, USA. Amen. He be beat the Cuban team, 50,000 spectators in the stadium. Amen. In 1988, became the first player to become, be named the Big Ten Conference Player of the Year. Amen. Jim uh, did all this. He pushed himself. He struggled. He was made fun of. Amen. He, he made sure that he did. Did he have a lot of failures? Yes, he did. Ever since he was young. Amen. Amen. It was just a flap on his skin. Amen. On his right hand because he had no hand on his right side. He was only left handed, but he overcame that. He learned to pitch and catch the ball with the same hand. He did everything he did. He struggled. He pushed. He endured. He failed. He got back up. He kept on moving again. He ended up winning 12 wins against the same number of losses from the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, the Angels uh, finished the 89 season third place, and Abbott was voted the rookie of the year. Amen. He was interviewed countless numbers of times by major networks and publications, but he turned down repeated book offers and received tons of mail. Questions about his ability still remained, however. Questions about his ability still remained. And in closing here today, in the summary of his story, he ended up signing almost a $2 million contract. He became the fourth highest paid pitcher in baseball history at the time. He was swapped to the New York Yankees, hit a no-hitter victory against the Cleveland Indians, and became a famous player of all time. You see, his ability outweighed his disability, but his availability outweighed it all. 
His ability outweighed his disability, but his availability outweighed it all. I'm here to tell somebody more than what you can do. Imagine what God wants to do in you. Praise God. Thank you all for listening tonight. I love you. Appreciate you. I cannot wait to come back into the house of God and have everybody come and worship the Lord and have a good time and let the spirit of the Lord come in and let the Holy Ghost fall and move amongst us in, in this place. Here at Christ Alive at 900 Gardner Avenue. Amen. And uh, our number is 559-762-2371. Amen. Reach out to us. We'll be happy to speak to you. God bless you. Love you. Appreciate you very much. Amen. Thank you all for listening tonight.